Good evening. Uh, the council was in closed session this evening, and so we are readjourning to our regular meeting. But I will have the uh, city attorney report out. Yes, thank you, Mayor. Uh, regarding this matter, there's no fraud found related to the uh, time card investigation, and the uh, direction was given to the city manager. Okay. With that, um, we will move on. Um, we've taken the roll call earlier this evening and all members are present. So at this time, we will move to the invocation by Jim Delhart, local businessman and former mayor. Well, I'm thankful for the opportunity that we can still pray in the public building. <laughs> I wanna pray tonight. God bless the city of Ceres. God bless the city council, mayor, everyone involved in the city. God give you a special ability with knowledge and wisdom to govern this beautiful city of ours. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May his face shine upon you and give you peace. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I pledge of allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, and liberty and justice for all. Okay, we have one presentation this evening, or, or excuse me, uh, it's a proclamation declaring August 4th through the 10th, 2019 as National Health Center Week in the city of Ceres. So I will, uh, I haven't got a proclamation, I'll go ahead and read this. Um, whereas for over 50 years, community health centers have provided high quality, affordable, comprehensive, primary and preventive health care in our nation's underserved communities delivering value to and having a significant impact on America's healthcare system. Whereas the country's largest primary care network, health centers, are the healthcare home for 28 million Americans in over 11,000 communities across the nation. One in every 12 people in the United States gets their care in a community health center. Health centers are a critical element of the health system serving both rural and urban communities and often providing the only accessible and dependable source of primary care in their communities. Nationwide, health centers serve one in every five residents of rural areas. Every day, health centers develop new approaches to integrating a wide range of services beyond primary care, including oral health, vision, behavioral health, and pharmacy services to meet the needs and challenges of their communities. Health centers are governed by patient majority boards, ensuring that the patients of each health center are engaged in their own health care decisions. Health centers are locally owned and operated small businesses that serve as critical income, excuse me, critical economic engines, helping to provide, excuse me, helping to power local economies by generating 54.6 billion in economic activity in some of the country's most economically deprived communities. Health centers nationally employ more than 220,000 people, including physicians, nurse practitioners, physicians assistants, and certified nurse midwives who work as part of a multidisciplinary clinical teams designed to treat the whole patient. National Health Center Week offers the opportunity to celebrate America's over 1,400 health center organizations with over 11,000 service delivery sites, their dedicated staff, board members, patients, and all those responsible for their continued success and growth since the first health care centers opened their doors more than 50 years ago. During National Health Center Week, we celebrate the legacy of America's health centers and their vital role in shaping the past, present, and future of America's health care system. Now, therefore, I, Chris Vieira, mayor of the city of Ceres, 
to hereby proclaim August 4th through the 10th, 2019 as National Health Center Week. I encourage all Americans to take part in this week by visiting their local health center and celebrating the important partnership between America's health centers and the communities they serve. Proclaim this 12th day of August, 2019. So, is there someone here to receive this? On behalf of Golden Valley Health Centers, I want to thank the City of Ceres for proclaiming National Health Center Week the week prior. Um, we do serve 100, about 150,000 patients in our area. We have about 1,000 employees, and uh, we have two health centers here in Ceres, and pretty soon we're going to be um, taking over one additional one. Um, that was under the health service agency. So it's our absolute pleasure to continue to bring health care access. Now, you mentioned one in 12 in the U.S. Here in the Valley is one in six. So it's really important, you know, the access that people do receive at our community health centers. So um, on behalf, again, as Golden Valley Health Center, thank you very much. Thank you. And next, we will move to citizens' communication to council on matters not included on the agenda. While the city council welcomes and encourages participation in city council meetings, adopted rules allow no more than five minutes for expression of non-agenda items. Matters under the jurisdiction of the city council and not on the posted agenda may be addressed by the general public. However, California law prohibits the city council from taking action on any matter which is not on the posted agenda unless it is determined to be an emergency by the city council. Citizens are entitled to address the city council on any agenda item subject to the five minute provision. This time I do have uh, three speaker cards, so I'll start with those and then I will open up to anyone else that would like to speak. The first one um, looks like it's uh, Joanne Vega. Hello, thank you, and thank you for serving. I really appreciate that you are up here. Um, I'm Joanne Vega. I live at 704 Monique Court. My husband and I, Vicente Vega, have lived in Ceres for 28 years. Uh, we moved from Tarboro Way, which is only two blocks away from where we live now, to Monique Court with the idea that it would be a better place, and we have a wonderful house. We love that. But there was a promise that there, there would be a park on River Road, and there would be a beautiful pond, and it'd be a wonderful place for our kids to grow up. Well, our first daughter is now 24. She's also a teacher, and her other daughter's going away to college, so they did not have that park when they were growing up. And the other uh, thing that we were promised was gorgeous landscaping along Central Avenue and River Road. Uh, we, pay, we paid a fee. I'm not, honestly, I don't even know if we still pay it, but I know we did pay it at one point. Um, and uh, when it started, it was gorgeous. There were beautiful trees lining River Road and Central, and now it is so ugly. They are dead. We did have a few come in, but they look like they're about to die again, and there is some jasmine that looks pretty much like it's about to die. There were even trees that were dead on Central, and they were still there, like for five months. It looks kind of like a really bad area. Even though if you look at our houses, they're gorgeous, but the going, I don't even walk down River Road or Central. It just looks nasty. So that's why I'm here. I know on, there is an agenda item that we don't have to pay an additional tax, but I don't think we're getting our money's worth for the tax that we did pay or still are paying. So um, I love gardening, but boy, it is, if you go down there, you know, you're going to. Was see. Um, was so that? That's uh, just what I wanted to tell you about. That it's on River Road in Central, and just take a walk, and you're going to see. I did get to talk to the landscape uh, architect, and eventually he will 
you know, it's definitely something that he's going to try to fix. Is that the corner of uh, uh, Central and, and River? Yes, you start um, River Road, and then it's Central, and then it's River Road. Yeah, so if it's about it's two blocks or four blocks. Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, so... Um, and w what's uh, the timing Mr. Condit the came uh, with um, my other neighbor, and we he took pictures, <laughs> so it's there. So that's what I just wanted you to know, that if you're going to have a fee, it needs to be a very well, you need to have the irrigation that takes care of those trees, because they will die with our is drought. And Is that area maintained by Howard? It's a <coughs> lighting and landscaping district. Um, we have replanted some plants out there. Unfortunately, they were stolen um, basically the day after they were planted. Uh, we've had a significant problem with vandalism in that area as well. Um, fixing irrigation heads and sprinklers in there kicked and broken within days of their being installed. So it is an area we struggle with. Um, Public Works um, Director Jeremy has been out and, and looked at that area, trying to come up with a plan to try and get that area back into the, obviously it's not in a condition that we feel is acceptable either, we agree, but we're struggling with how to continue to battle the vandalism, the challenges we have in that particular area. So um, there's no easy solution, but we are aware of the, the challenge and we'll, we'll come up with a plan to try and fix it. So I think the, the takeaway is we're aware that it's not looking the way that it should and we're trying to improve that. Okay, you. thank you. And then as far as the park goes, Mr. Wells, what's the Yeah, so the, the park, um, for Lions Park that she's referencing um, is under design. The, um, we hope to have that out to bid here by the end of this calendar year for the first phase, which would be at least the um, playground area. So the first, first piece of that park, we hope to have that out to construction and be completed sometime summer of next year is the, is the target. Both Eastgate Park and Lions Park are both in a similar time frame. Okay. Okay, um, the next card we have is Nora George. Thank you for all of your hard work that you put in the city of Ceres. And uh, I am a neighbor of Joanne Wade in Vega, and we brought it to Chance's attention. We appreciate his help. Yes, the corner of River Road and Central, it's, it looks like city dump. The trees, there's no um, drip system underneath the trees. The trees are dying, and it's really awful. Uh, I'd like to live in a clean place. We are taxpayers, and we don't get our m money's worth there. Um, I put latex gloves on, just go around the neighborhood, collect um, garbage, too. They, they, it seems to, like everybody, it's a dumpster. You know, they just dump things out of their car, and I don't want to live in an environment like that. I take pride in keeping my home and landscaping clean and my neighborhood clean and I don't appreciate all that mess. So yeah, we've, be, we've been living there for 16 years. At the beginning it was good and now it's gone really downhill and something needs to be done. And I appreciate you guys doing something about it. Thank <coughs> you. Okay, thank you. The last one we have is uh, Michael Bagley. I'm Michael Bagley. My address is 1305 Oak Ridge Drive, uh, Modesto. Um, it's by uh, Moffitt and Canyon. I believe it's like series, but a Modesto address. I've been there since about 2002. Um, I just wanted to bring an incident uh, to your awareness. Um, I'm not upset with anybody or not trying to do anything. I just want to bring an incident for maybe next time if it happens to somebody else. Um, it might help things go a little faster. <clears throat> but on August 2nd, uh, I was at, my little girl had a before school activities where you drop off your supplies and uh, meet your teachers and stuff. And it was at Summit Charter School on Hat, I think it's 2036 Hat Road in Central. Um, great school, great staff. Um, but my son went with me, he was 11, he just went with me uh, to take my daughter's stuff there. And um, we were outside, they had ice creams and stuff, but my son, uh, uh, he fainted or he passed out. Um, um, anyways, the school at 358 called 911. Um, and my son, it took him a long time to come to. I didn't, I didn't know what had happened to him. I didn't know. I just never, you know, it's not something I deal with every day. Um, 
About 402, 403, I used my cell phone and called 911 myself, too, because they just weren't there yet. And basically, I was part of this. Um, I was on the phone with them for five minutes, and they said, okay, we're going to hang up now. Um, then I got a call back from 209-236-8100. I got a call back on my cell phone uh, 20 minutes from the time we called later, and it was um, they were just saying, hey, we're going to keep you on the phone. Uh, we can't get there. Um, um, so then um, at 419, I stayed on the phone with them, and on, I, my, my cell phone shows that it took them six more minutes from there to get there, and that's when I ended the call. Um, but I had called three times, once from a landline, the school called. School did great. School did everything they could. Um, the diagnosis is the good thing is my son's okay. Uh, he had heat exhaustion. You know, but I don't know if you guys have ever seen your kids pass out or anything, but it was pretty scary for me. Um, but overall, it, it took uh, 27 minutes for a medical emergency at the school. Um, and I just wanted to bring it to the awareness, maybe next time for the next person, or just, I just want it to be heard, that's all. Because to me, 27 minutes is pretty significant for a child at a school that basically went unconscious. Um, so I, I just wanted to bring that to your attention. And that's it, thanks. Mr. Wells, is there something we can look into as far as with AMR? Or? Yeah, Chief, Chief Wise can follow up on the, the call okay. situation, what happened there, and how that routing process worked. Okay. Thank you. Um, the next one is, um, it looks like Dave Pratt. Do you have a little presentation? Uh, Dave Pratt is series. Uh, yeah, I went to a three and a half hour uh, presentation. Uh, there's uh, millions of dollars out there, grant money out there for uh, housing uh, from Veteran Housing and Homelessness Prevention Program. And uh, basically it's for building for homeless veterans. Uh, so anybody that's willing to build, um, I'll only give you one copy because I wanna pass this around to other the rather cities and the communities. Uh, uh, basically, most of the money goes to the metropolitan areas, and down at the bottom it says other, and I feel <coughs> the valley is other, and then I'd like to see that in that in, improved. So if anybody's interested in, in the PowerPoint, I have, I'll, I'll be glad to email that to anybody that's interested. But, I, uh, but basically, it, it gives a, I just give, like I said, a synopsis of, of that. Uh, I went to Modesto Council meeting, uh, and the very last on the agenda was trash. And basically, they're getting three loaner cameras that they're going to stick out in the high dumping areas and see how that works. If they like it, they're going to get get their own cameras to set it to do that. Unfortunately, like Ceres, they only have one code enforcement officer, and basically they don't get to cover weekends either, and and they're limited. But they they do have somebody that uh, that's on the desk for that for the code enforcement. And my other uh, other thing is, um, we're still seeing a whole lot of. Uh, shopping carts out there and I still would like to see that whenever these play these businesses replace their carts they they replace them with something that that's not easy uh, to haul off I've a couple times I've ridden cross Mitchell Road bridge and there's about 20 or 30 carts and just in one corner alone and uh, last year when the canal dried out there was one uh, one one of those electric uh, disabled carts from Walmart that was in the canal, and I'm hoping I don't see any more of those. Otherwise, you we're know, going to have to do something with that. Uh, thank you. Thank you. This time I don't have any more speaker cards, is, um, so I'll open up. Is there anyone else that would like to address the council on a non-agenda item? If so, please come forward and state your name. Yeah, Gene Yakely series. <clears throat> I got a few items that just crossed my mind and maybe some people behind me's mind. Uh, I'd like to know what happens to 
the money that we accumulated from what the police and the fire department did on the 4th of July, if that all goes to the general fund or is it split up and some of it goes to the general fund and back to these groups that, that surely need it. That's just one item. Another one is, <clears throat> if I, I think Mayor Vera brought this up before, if I, uh, to help code enforcement, if I send a photo to the city website for code enforcement, does the code enforcement go out and issue a citation from the photo evidence? The next one, if the city has cameras placed to stop dumping, why is Central and Walnut, which is really Laurel there, Walnut and Laurel location, continuously uh, still a dumping site? Supposedly, I guess, what, a month or so ago, there was a lady and a man that came up in individual uh, council meetings that said they had a camera put up. I guess Toby mentioned that. And it seemed like their dumping problem vanished. But this particular area continues, and probably Toby knows that the city goes out there probably at least once, maybe twice a week, to pick up trash right underneath a sign that says there's a fine from the city, a series of, I believe, $1,000. Then we go to with the hiring of a new code enforcement officer, why do we still not have an officer on the weekend duty? Well, I talked to the sergeant before about that and he said it's probably not gonna happen. Uh, they need their time off too. And then I told him that, you know, fire department police don't stop on weekends. They won't work on weekends. It's just a matter of who gets what shift. Uh, uh, is this going to happen continuously? without, uh, and are the citizens that violate our codes going to still have some control of what happens here in our city? It seems like they do on weekends. They, it's a free-for-all. They do whatever they want. Nothing seems to happen on some of these items that code enforcement should take care of on the weekends now that we have the funding for it. They will continue to do whatever they wish, and weekends will continue to be a sort of do whatever you want to do because Weekends here has no enforcement in series, and they know that. Next one, I am, am I right that the city council, meaning the mayor and everybody sitting up there, has the power to uh, dictate to probably Toby Wells and Toby Wells to the police and the fire department on the scheduling of code enforcement? Time has ticked too long and the city needs weekend enforcement now and not later. Weekend code enforcement violating warriors need to stop now. A message needs to be sent to those in our city who violate and disrespect our codes. Thank you. Mr. Yagley, what was your second item? Second uh, item? Yes. The camera placements. The what? Oh, camera yeah. placements. Okay. All right, so the first question, the money for the fireworks. Fireworks citations due to go in the general fund. Okay. For that. What Which means it goes to police and fire. Yeah. What we do actually collect, recognize, just because you wrote a citation doesn't mean we actually are able to collect that citation. W would there be so any way that we could put it towards next year's preventative measures? It's the same place. I mean, it, it, as long as that's what the chief, I mean, as you know, the general fund is, you know, it's all it's 90% it's police and fire. So if they decide that they want to do that, they can do that. Yeah, next year. Next but year's I, effort would be next fiscal year. Okay, so. I just think it'd be good, pretty beneficial to put it towards overtime for our men and women out there who are serving us to get more fines. That's how we'll benefit and how we'll be able to build, build this program each and every year. That's so, so when that money does come available through the uh, administrative citations that the police and fire for 4th of July, 4th and 5th, I believe it was, uh, when that money comes through, that all goes to the general fund? Correct. Correct. So, so then if, now it would be just us giving them direction to make it specifically for that area within <laughs> their departments. But they already get it anyway. Right now they have the discretion to use it how they would like. But if you want to specifically say that's just what you want to use it for, then that would be the direction that we would give and them. And they already did include funding for next year's effort in, yeah. in the actual budget. Well, my question is on that is if it's in the general fund and some of that money or all of it gets used, hopefully not, and the fire and the police department needs it, 
where's it gonna come from? That's the, the budgeting process. That's what we do every yeah. year with the budget. Could we split some of that up and just have them have their own fund for that 4th of July money? They give some to the general fund and, and the other to, you know? Yeah, the general the fund thing. is made up, what I'm saying is everything that goes into there goes to them. So well, yes, a rhetorical question you're asking is, can the money go for them? The money is going for them in part of the general fund. So I, I, I guess I'm lost as to what, and, and we're saying right now they have the ability through the budgeting process to use that money how they see fit. If we say that we want it to be just for the 4th of July activities, then they can come forth with us and say that's how they would like to do it, and it sounds like we would support that. Okay. You might want to do that. <laughs> Next year's Thank budget. You. Okay, so yeah, the, the money's not going anywhere else. It's not going to water or anything else. It's going to them, so. You're not the city attorney. You answer. Okay, now you had a couple other things I want to address. Um, the, the camera situation, uh, you know, w w the city doesn't, I mean, we have a few, but I think, uh, uh, were you advocating you wanted the city to do more? Is that what you're saying, or? No, I, I think the city knows that right there at Laurel and Pine, right. that, uh, well, I hate to say it, low-income community there, that, that one sidewalk street, there's a drive right there. They've been doing this for years and years and years, and it doesn't You'd stop. like to see a camera there. We've already targeted that area, and we haven't been successful in catching anyone yet. Really? We, we have been targeting that area. But yes. do you know that... We have two cameras, and we are purchasing two more as part of the budget this year. Bertolotti or somebody comes there quite often, right? Of course. Yeah. We're very familiar with that location. And then the last thing, uh, code enforcement on the weekends, we'll, we'll be looking to, to change that so that we do have coverage over the weekend. Oh, that's so. great. Because the longer we wait, it just keeps come getting larger and larger in the issues. And, and I think... You know, some of you people live in areas that have problems as well as the rest of us and those folks behind us too. So the sooner we can take care of that, and I know people don't like to work weekends, but you know, maybe it won't have to last forever, but until we have a pattern, we keep enforcing and enforcing, people get an idea that we're not playing with them anymore, that they're gonna be fined or disciplined, then you know, things are gonna start getting better. Mm -hmm. Now that we've got some money. Thank okay. you. All right, is there anyone else that would like to address the council on a non-agenda item? Hi, Shauna Moore, City of Ceres. Um, I'm at 1917 Lupin Lane. I just had a question because on the weekends, um, like they have mentioned, we don't have code enforcement. I have a lot of food vendors in my neighborhood that set up on corners and sell corn and elote and, and melons and you name it. And I'm just, do we issue them permits to come out on the weekends? or I mean, is that even allowed in the city of Ceres? Because we don't allow taco trucks. Well, you guys must have been reading some of our mind lately because that whole conversation came up. And what we've learned is in the state legislature's infinite wisdom, they've taken away our ability to go after the street vendors um, with as much, I think I heard that one of, um, I don't know if it was an assembly member or Senate, that believe that all small businesses started from their home, so we shouldn't have to make it unduly difficult. So um, unless we get them for doing some type of violation for blocking the street or something, um, not only do I'm hearing that they don't need a permit, but they're Can not- washing facility. Uh, uh, environmental health, if there's something we can do, we might be able to tackle it there. But, the ability to go after them has gotten, or, or to at least regulate them, has gotten a little more uh, difficult for us. Gotcha. Um, our hands are kind of tied. That doesn't mean we can't do some things, but, um, but yeah, that's, um, you know, again, don't get me started on the state. Um, so we'll, we'll do what we can, but, um, you know, it's just, I, I don't agree with it, but it's what we have to do. I got your hands tied, I understand. Thank you for your time, I appreciate it. Is there anyone else? Here we go. <laughs> Don Donaldson. Uh, he said about uh, veterans getting a, a loan uh, 50 some years later, I can get a loan to get a house. Just the other day, I got a medal for being in Vietnam 55 years ago. Nothing like being late. But I did go to Vietnam and I did get sprayed with Agent Orange. 
I'm a 100% disabled veteran. I bought units from Lemke here whenever they tore the church down, and I had them at home. I gave one of them to, to a lady that was elderly. She wanted a compressor. She only needed a compressor, but I gave her the whole thing because it's the, the Freon is different. So uh, anyway, I got rid of that one. I just got rid of a, a three and a half ton for $2,000. I gave it to a guy. 2000 and I put it on for him because the code enforcement says you can't have that air conditioner in a box brand new in your driveway so I got rid of it I got rid of the bicycle little bicycle another one across the street little boy I'm getting rid of everything that that I own getting down I'm trying to get rid of my motor homes and everything so all I have to do is just pay my water bill 500 to 320 some dollars and my electric bill two hundred dollars five hundred dollars for me to live there that it used to cost me a hundred and twelve dollars my social security the wife and I is two thousand dollars that's one-fourth of my social security good thing good thing that I have more income coming in but I'm it, it's just like now that I can get my taxes completely paid for from Stanislaus County because I'm a veteran, disabled veteran. I'm in Prop 13. I don't do that because I'm, I'm getting enough. But I can get free taxes. But the thing is, is probably the code enforcement will be, every time I come up here, it's not but a couple of days or a week later the code enforcement comes over to my house. I don't know if this is on purpose or whatever. But I'm trying, look, look, this is what happened. I went to the military. I served my country. I come back. I run a basketball program for series for 34 years. I served my city. I re-roofed, put air conditioners, put gutter, and put everything on the houses around my community. So I've done a little bit for my community. President Kennedy said, ask not what you can do for your country, ask what your country can do for you. What else can I do for the people? You want me to throw everything away? You want me to throw my Zinsco breakers, my Brian Baker, when people want them? They come over on Sunday, Don, you got a, yep. You got a gas valve? Yep. You got a start compressor? Yep. They can have them. My, my garage out in the back, the door's even open. They can go in there and get whatever they want. So the code enforcement is, is good, but I've got a lot of junk, and I know it's junk for a lot of people. But for a lot of people, that junk can help them out. And I don't want to throw it away. So, and, I, and I've got a big barbecue there. The thing is about six foot long and four foot. I bought it from a kid that was in FFA. He wanted to go to Disneyland. I bought it from him. Don, can I have you, Did wrap, I need up, it? Can nope. I have you wrap up your comments? We're getting to All the right. end there. I will. Okay. That's the only thing is code enforcement is good. They need to go over to Eastgate and look at all of them lawns there that's dead. They can't afford their water bill, so they're letting all their lawns go dead. My son is letting his go dead, and I jumped all over him the other day. I said, hey, get that. Dad, my water bill is $163. Okay. Thanks. All right. Is there anyone else in the audience that would like to address the council on a non-agenda item? Good evening, John Warren Series. Um, in regards to the fireworks uh, event and um, code enforcement, the fireworks crew that was out th this past 4th of July, I think, really did an excellent job with 56 or so citations with four or five officers being involved actively uh, patrolling our streets. 
as a suggestion in the um, upcoming fourths as we're gonna have uh, the years roll by, is it possible to maybe develop or coordinate a regional effort in this regard um, within Stanislaus County with just Ceres doing it by themselves versus joining forces with the Modesto Police Department, Riverside, Patterson, um, and the outlying agencies and all working together to have a maximum enforcement with all the communities may result in more than 56 citations in one community. It may result in several hundred throughout the county. And working together, you send a message to the folks that uh, this kind of behavior is not acceptable. Um, and then with the funding going into the general fund, if it's earmarked specifically for next year's activities in enforcement, that kind of puts that money in a special spot that's not gonna be used for another emergency someplace else. So just a thought for the council to consider, please. Okay, anyone else? Okay, at this time, we will move on to appointments to boards and commissions. We have none this evening. Conflict of interest declaration. Is there anyone on the council that would like to declare a conflict of interest on any of the consent calendar items or one public hearing? I don't have a con I I'm sorry. I don't have a conflict, but I want it to be on the record that item number three, I will be abstaining since I was not here at the meeting. Okay. All right. The consent calendar, all matters listed on the consent calendar are considered routine in nature and will be enacted by a single motion unless otherwise requested by an individual council member or the public for special consideration. Otherwise, the recommendation of staff will be accepted and acted upon by roll call vote. At this time, is there anyone on the council that would like a consent calendar item pulled for further discussion? Item nine. All right, is there anyone in the audience? I, that would item 10 and 11. Okay. Is there anyone in the audience that would like an item pulled for further discussion other than 9, 10, and 11? Okay. Hearing none, I will bring it back to the council for direction on the other items. Move to approve 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. Second. Did you want to leave 3 out? Or? Well, they're just you can just record me as abstain from 3. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so we have a motion. And you do second? I second. Okay, and a motion and a second. Can we have the roll call vote, please? Council Member Condit? Aye. Council Member DeRosset? Yes. Vice Mayor Rhino? Yes. Council Member Klein? Yes. And Mayor Vieira? Yes. Motion passes 5 0, and on item 3A, it's 4 with one abstention by Council Member Klein. Thanks. Okay, uh, item number 9, resolution number 2019 84, approving an enterprise agreement with Microsoft Office 365 and authorizing the city manager to execute the agreement. Uh, Vice Mayor Rhino? I didn't see in the staff report what the cost would be, but it did show um, somewhere in the staff report that it was budgeted. And so I looked at the budget and it looked like it was 75,000 for the cost. Is that correct? That's correct. Um, what's not in the budget is the savings associated with the group wise server that is an end of life. So well, when you factor that, if we didn't make this change to the Microsoft Office update, we would have had to replace the server with group wise and we would have had to do additional costs. So from a overall cost perspective going forward, there is an impact of the budget of $75,000, but it is in lieu of other costs we would have had to spend to stay on the group wise. And the 75,000 in the budget said it was for all the workstations. Correct. But yet when I look at the staff report, it says the license covers up to five workstations, five mobile devices, and five mobile phones for each user. Correct. So I, so I didn't understand that. What that means is the way Microsoft license is set up, an individual, once you have a license covered by the city, you can use that, like for my, my purposes, I have a desk computer, as well as a laptop, and as well as a cell phone. So it covers up to five devices under that license. It'll cover five of your personal devices. So everybody that has it has up to five devices. Oh, okay. Right? Yeah. All right, those are my only questions. Are there any other questions? Okay, anyone in the audience have any comment on this item? 
Okay, hearing none, I'll bring it back to the council for direction. Move to adopt resolution number 2019-84. Second. We have a motion and a second. Can we have the roll call vote, please? Council member Condit. Aye. Council member DeRosset. Yes. Vice Mayor Rhino. Yes. Council member Klein. Yes. And Mayor Vieira. Yes. Motion passes 5-0. Okay, item number 10, resolution number 2019-85, ordering the levying and collection of a special taxes for fiscal year 2019-2020 within the city of Ceres Community Facilities District Number One for Public Services. Council Member Condit. Sure, I just have a few questions pertaining to item 10 and 11. Uh, why is the engineering department overseeing the collection of these special taxes and not the finance department? Well, the engineering department's not overseeing the collection. What engineering is responsible for is through the, the mapping process of when developments are occur they are responsible for ensuring that any new development is added into those CFDs. So their responsibility is ensuring the reporting piece and the assessment, getting that to the um, assessor's office who ultimately collects it. Okay. Assessor's office at Stanislaus County collects those funds, then they're remitted to the, the city finance. So the finance department receives all of the money. So okay. the administration, goes through the correct. Okay. The administration of the finances does go through the department. Sure, okay. And um, so do these special taxes, when it comes back from the assessors to the finance department, they go into the general fund? Uh, they actually go into a special fund. Okay. Um, they're, they're individual. There's three separate funds, police, fire, and parks. Those separate funds are then transferred. And I can, Ms. Dean can explain that in a little more detail, but okay. that's the special fund, then it's, to the general it's fund. It's one okay. fund, and there's several line items in there that identify the administration, parks, police, and fire um, components. And those um, amounts are allocated um, based on the formulas that were established when the um, CFD was adopted. But it's all in Fund 270. Okay. And so do we have an estimated cost for each household in these districts if this, pa if this tax is passed tonight? It's part of the engineering report, um, the, assess the assessment. A lot of these, they're... Um, it's a set amount and there were no escalators built in some of these have escalators I think Jeremy may be a little more familiar with um, How it was established, but most of this has been around for a long time About 20 years worth the what's being approved tonight is basically an annual escalation for those districts that have an annual escalation um, district one uh, is a lower amount than district two okay. um, so the annual what, uh, what kind of determines that it's it's literally where they were where they're located. Okay. So each district had a different um, assess association assessment associated with it. So basically, what was included in the district at the time it was formed mm -hmm. sets the rate and also sets how it can be increased. And how many districts? As of right now, there's two. A two. third is uh, ready to be adopted. Okay. And is the 3.87 increase the standard increase? Yeah, it's a cost of living. It's a CPI. Okay. So Just those, cost of living. When those districts are adopted it sets the range and how they can be annually increased okay. so there's a an index that it's referenced to and that's what we're allowed to by law we can only go up relative okay. to that index and so w was the budget that the council passed in june based on the assumption that the council would pass this tax yes okay thank you okay. are there any other questions is there anyone in the audience have any questions on this item Okay, if not, I'll bring it back to the council for direction. Did you want to take both of these or do you want to do them? We can do separate? them both. Okay. So I'll look for a motion. Move to adopt resolution number 2019-85 and resolution number 2019-86. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Can we have the roll call vote, please? Council member Condit. Nay. Council member DeRosset. Yes. Vice Mayor Rhino. Yes. Council Member Klein. Yes. And Mayor Vieira. Yes. Motion passes 4-1. Okay. Uh, we have no unfinished business, so we have one public hearing. Resolution number 2019-87, adopting a new schedule of fees, charges, and policies for facilities, park rentals, and recreation classes. Good evening, City Council. Tonight we present um, the Recreation Department a three-year study, our three-year fee increases uh, to fund the increased fees of renting the facilities from a minimum wage, which was mandated by the state of California. We right now have to give employees raises a dollar each year, um, an hourly wage. 
also is the cost of the community center trying to bring in the revenue to offset the operation cost. One of the goals of the council is to make the community center um, cost neutral to the city and we're well on our way to get there. So tonight that's why I bring the fees to you because next um, council meeting I'm gonna do a presentation regarding um, how we can get to um, full cost recovery on the community center. So tonight after we discuss the fees, if you adopt them, we'll be um, implementing them on August 19th. And I just wanted to give you a little brief information on some of the fee changes um, and kind of um, why we made those changes. And one of the things is one of the greatest availability time we have in this building is um, Monday through Thursday. So changing some of our fees that maybe making it less red tape for the business community to use the facility. Um, a lot of times requiring the deposit if um, for them to have a small meeting in our conference room is a burden um, and takes time. So we've made those adjustments and we've also made some adjustments that we think that will protect the city's revenues. And so I'm gonna kind of go through um, our sections. So we're gonna start off with the community center um, and council has it up there at section A. Um, and I'm gonna just give you kind of the highlights and kind of why we decided to go that route. Um, and if you have any questions after that, let me know. Um, so the community center, we're proposing a 5% increase for the next three years. Again, a lot of that's based on minimum wage um, going up. Um, with that increase, um, those fees would go in effect. So if today if I rent the facility, um, I'm gonna get the fee of at the rate at this time. So once the council adopts this facility, any rental booked after that date will have to um, pay that fee. So just a little information. Um, a lot of our reservations are booked 12 months in advance for the community center in Legion Hall, especially for Fridays and Saturdays, and we've seen a huge uptick on Wednesdays and Thursday nights too. So in uh, our fees for the community center, we added one new fee. It was during the week. Um, for Wednesday and Thursday, if they want to use it, um, we've had a lot of pre-weddings and um, banquets in here, and they want the full day. Like, you are able to rent on Friday and Saturday for a price. So we implemented the same price as Friday, um, and they'd get the full day from 8 a, 8.30 a.m. to midnight. Um, we did not have that fee before, so how they were getting charged, they were getting charged more than the Friday rate. Um, so we implemented that new fee. Um, and we made some changes to our policies. Um, we had a lot of people counseling their rentals 30 days before, and usually a rental is about $1,800 um, and a lot of staff time. So we made some adjustments to our um, refund policy, how much money you get back. Right now, I had someone counsel the community, a rental 30 days out, and we kept only $300 of the deposit and gave everything back. So we've made some uh, changes in that to, since that is a reservation that we fill up really quick, that there is a penalty. Um, and it's not huge, but you know, if you wait till the last minute to council, that we can recover that cost. But also I know when me with the city manager, um, he brought up um, Councilmember Klein's idea of, hey, what happens if that date becomes available three months out? How can we make, get that date filled? Because having an empty building isn't, Always. So we have a policy now we, we want the council to approve tonight is if that, whatever money we keep from the renter um, before will help offset that renter to come in last minute to rent the building. So if we keep $1,000 of the renter, uh, the first renter's time, renter A, um, the second renter, let's say uh, the building cost is $1,800 for the, let's say Saturday, they would key, um, pay $800 plus $100 additional administrative fee because taking the deposit, some of the stuff, the um, admin time it takes to get another renter in here. So it'd be $900, for example. Um, that's just to try to get the most bang for our buck. Um, next is Legion Hall. Um, and we've seen an uptick in Legion Hall. We're proposing 2% increases this next year with Legion Hall and for all three years. Um, there's modest increases um, to that. And then what we really wanted to do is make some changes that make it easier for businesses to come in and stuff, and some of our fees and charges too. Um, how we had them set up before, they were very timely for staff to back out admin fees out of the fee for, let's say, security guards. It was caught, we pay 23, but we bill the customer 26, and back in that time, 
that $3 out at the very end when we see the um, security bill. So we made some adjustments based on staff. We worked closely with finance to make these changes that we can save time. And some of the changes we're suggesting is um, security guard regular time would be $26 an hour. Um, right now it's currently 26 and 27. Um, and we would now just charge the going rate, the build rate from the vendor um, moving forward. So we would add on a actual security admin fee if people do need security. Um, you usually need security if you have alcohol or a large event. That would be an additional $40 um, on top of the rental fee. Insurance, same thing. It was We were increasing these costs and then backing out the fees. If you want to use the city's insurance policy, there would just be a, a one-time $15 admin fee for your event. One thing we haven't done, and we put a lot of time, um, it takes a lot of time for the fire department to approve open flames. If they're outside barbecuing or inside the building, if we have um, the chafing districts. So we, we're proposing that a $25 fee. We work closely with the fire chief on putting this together. Um, and we would collect that fee and it, it'd actually go into the um, fire department um, when the time the customer paid. And we're trying to streamline that also to make that go a lot smoother. One thing is we were very, um, um, I had a great opportunity with BVG, uh, Valley Grace Church moving in. We're gonna get some upgrades to our um, audio visual equipment here. So we wanna make that available to the business community and we don't wanna nickel and dime them for everything. So we wanted to set up a business package because we have a stage, we have microphones, we have the TV. So a flat fee if they use the large or small assembly room and it'd be um, 150 if they use the large assembly room a day and $100 if they use the small assembly. Um, a few other things we did in here is uh, cleaning fees. We have some renters that leave the kitchen a mess and stuff. So we wanted to build out those individual fees and staff, um, we contract with the company to do the um, janitorial work here. So those fees in here would go towards paying the cost plus admin fees. Um, the next area is our um, park rental fees and this includes fields and, and parks. So basically in these fees, if we already have a, a contract or agreement with like Series Youth Soccer or BVG, they're not in here. They're, they have a separate contract that maintains that. So I know the fields are one thing in here and some of those fees aren't in here because they're separate from this. Um, so really one of the challenges here is when people come to rent the picnic shelters, they have to come in and pay and put a $40 deposit down to get the sign. And usually they you know, rent it six months in advance and they have to come pick the sign up on Friday and come return it on Monday and then they get their $40 back. What we're asking council is to get rid of the $40, increase the fees by $5 for the picnic shelters in year one and year two of the fee study. Um, and we're gonna have staff go out and put the signs in. We really feel that this is great customer service and also worry with our new software that we just implemented last week, all these reservations can be done online for the picnic shelter. So residents can do them 24 seven, they can get refunded. And you, it's a very burdensome for $40 to get a, cut a check and you know, collect the money and then cut a check back to the residents. So if you do approve this tonight, we'll be refunding the $40 to all the current people that have picnic future reservation shelters with us. We're keeping the soccer field cost the same right now. We did delete out the tournament fees. Um, kind of, we're on the higher end, so in year three, we're proposing a $3 increase to the fees if you're a tier one or tier two rate. Um, next is our recreation program fees. Um, kind of on here is really gauging again, these, some of these are really staff driven. We also get a lot of, right now we've really focused on trying to get more work with the business community to bring in more recreation programs, which has been very, very successful. Um, and on that is we wanted to kind of have a three year study that we can implement um, that. So our swim lessons are a little higher than Modesto, but they haven't done a fee study in, since 2003 when we met with them a few months. So our fees are pretty comparable. Um, our swim, some of the stuff is our swim lessons do jump up a couple dollars, most of the fees. Um, our tiny top baseball, these are very popular programs that are filled. There's also scholarships available if people need assistance um, for that. And some of the new fees here we're proposing is um, a recreation swim pass for like 10 bucks for the whole summer. Um, we're trying to get away from getting all this cash and trying to go more 
debit credit card, um, m money order, or check. And we really think like a $10 pass would be great for the kids who want to go swimming at the high school pool. Um, another few were coming in and asking this year is that our camp series, it was very successful. We had 24 spots a week. And I want to say seven of the eight weeks were filled with 24 spots. Um, so we are proposing modest increases in that program. And next is kind of, a, I wanted to share also all the free stuff we do. We have a lot of great events and the count, I want to thank the council for funding that additional funds this year that we can um, um, enhance these events. Um, again, our trunk or tree um, was a huge success. Our spotlight, um, our Christmas tree lane. What we're asking for the city, um, the council has approved um, a lot. We met with the trunk or tree um, organizations afterwards, um, after we presented them awards to the council. And some of them said, can you guys just get the candy? We'll pay you 50 bucks. So we wanted to have a fee if they wanted the candy provided by us. We'd go buy it in a large quantity, it'd be $50. They don't, they want to get their own candy, like the Boy Scouts, each kid brings a bag of candy, that's great. They wouldn't be charged a fee. Um, again, that's um, a $50 fee for the booth. And last um, on here, like I shared with Concert the Park, our youth government program. Um, and one thing is future services and programs um, is that you get permission for the recreation manager to set fees um, in here instead of having to come back each year for fees. Um, we do have some new programs like Get Fit Series, um, which is a, we kind of revamped it to um, get more people in the classes and make it more affordable. And last um, in here is our contractual services. And like I said, this is an area we're growing a lot in, um, bringing in gymnastics, more classes. We were only offering Mondays. Now we offer Monday and Saturdays and the classes are filled. We're bringing in more diverse camps and stuff. And we can't do that with always city staff. Um, contractual um, programming is very successful. A lot of instructors are very co cost conscious of the price. I have to say I'm very impressed when I meet with them. Um, when we bring them on, they keep it affordable for the kids. Um, and we've had some camps this year that had 20 kids in them for you know $150. So they are more popular. We're gonna offer more Lego camps. Um, here we wanna offer um, contract right now. We don't contract for adult sports program. Um, is maybe contracting with a group that runs adult softball. The next piece of the fee study is marriage services. Um, I work closely with the city clerk on putting this together. We're going to be working closely with our new software and using this facility is providing um, marriage license. Oh, am I saying that right? Marriage license? No. Marriage say? Ceremonies. Ceremonies. Thank you. Um, to the public here, um, they would use our software to schedule it. Um, and they'd be offered every other week, um, like on a Wednesday for two hours. Sometimes they'd be offered here at the community center, especially during the winter months, and then other months at Whitmore Park. And this is a way to bring in additional revenue. Right now the county does offer this service, um, but we think we can do a great job and charge a little more because we, our facility is very nice. And some of the extra things we're gonna do, like set up a room that they have 25 people, or 20 or 25 people at the wedding service. Um, these fees, the city clerk, we work closely with her um, on the, the what I'm um, getting these set up and refunding, or if something, let's say it rains and we can't do it outside, the recreation tour to take the lead. Um, so really, you Paul, your biggest question is revenue, uh, how this brings in. You remember, most of our reservations are already 12 months out. So really, this 5% increase that if it happens August 19th really is going to bring in 1 or 2% more this fiscal year. Um, so it would be implemented in going forward July 1st on the facility rental fees and um, we're expecting some decent revenue. I really think for the community center, I'm going to share probably my report in two weeks is we really need to focus on Monday through Thursday. There's a lot of opportunity there um, and how we go about doing that, um, the availability. But the fees, you know, we're projecting to bring in over the four, three years, 140000 about in revenue. Um, this was, should cover the additional costs in staffing and also working on getting the community center um, cost neutral to the city. Is that it? <laughs> All right, okay, is there any questions? I don't have any names up here. <laughs> You're not Johnson and I don't. Councilmember Klein? So, 
didn't the city just just work into an agreement with the church? So it's a two part question: with the church to rent the facility on Sunday to help offset the increased cost of of wages and things like and 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 going in that direction. Yes. Okay. So, and the other thing, the second part of that question is, so how does it affect the agreement that's already been placed with the church? Um, it has an annual increase of um, 2 to 3%. I don't have that in front of me. Part of it is, is that there's not as administrative work with that agreement compared to one-time rentals. So it's set up to go up annually, July 1st, um, a certain amount for the contract. So the city goes into an agreement with the church to help offset the cost and the wage increases, and now you're looking for fee increases to do the same thing? Yes. Um, we're still short the deficit. I will, in my presentation in two weeks, I'll share kind of where we're at and how to move forward on getting there. Um, we're getting closer and closer, but part of it was um, it, the church still doesn't bring us into cost recovery. Uh, last question I have for you. What other local facilities keep a portion of the deposit for cancellations? So, and, and, and I mean long term. Let's say I rent this thing a year, for, year from now. Something comes up three months before my uh, event that I can't use a facility. And you're going to keep a portion of my, my, my deposit. What other facilities locally, and I'm saying locally by Stanislaus County, Keep a portion if you count, count, uh, if you cancel your reservation within a certain period of time. I have to study that. In the Park and Recreation industry, um, it's usually uh, kind of on the schedule we put on um, the refund. But here's the thing is they take up a room that doesn't get used. It, they take it away from someone else. So when we sat down with finance, we had a discussion of, hey, like if someone wants to change a recreation class, we're not going to charge them a refund fee. You know, they, they get that flexibility because there's a lot of demand and a lot of opportunity in recreation. If you want to rent the large room, you could, I mean, it could cost the city, um, you know, we had three or four rental cancellations in the last few months. That is eight or $9,000 we lose out in revenue. And I understand that, but if I book a hotel room in San Francisco and something comes up and I cancel within 48 hours, I get 100% I get of my, my deposit and everything back. I, I guess with um, hotel rooms a little different. It's, there's a there's a large amount of them where there's just one large room here. So, so my question is, what would make me not go to another jurisdiction and reserve something, knowing that if something came up ahead of time, that I'll get my hundred percent of my deposit back? Um. On that, I think the jurisdictions were similar now. We're more in line with them. Um, I think, you know, competitive-wise, we have an edge, being close to the freeway, having a newer facility, convenient, um, that we don't have that challenge. Um, but it does cost the city um, a large amount of money if someone does cancel, and, you know, it's 30 days out. So we're trying to find the best medium of trying to collect that revenue and not trying to over-penalize the renter um, we know emergencies come up, um, and we can be sometimes flexible. Um, but sometimes we just get a call, oh, we had both facilities booked, and we decided to go with the other one, and it's 30 days out from the rental. But reading in your report that let's say I cancel it, and you keep $200 of my deposit, um, $100, $200, let's say, okay, and you re-rent it, okay, the... The second renter is going to get a credit of $200. So why don't you give the first person back their money because you re-rented it? I guess I, at that last, um, when people cancel two or three months out, it's very hard to rent that room. So part of it was an incentive for the second renter to come in and get that room rented out um, because of the last minute cancellation um, instead of having to pay the full cost. Um, a lot of times, like I said, most of Friday and Saturday stuff is booked. Well, but booked. I would think I would I would think that you know, knowing that I lost my deposit, but if you re-rent it, then I'm going to get the, the rest of my portion of deposit. That's a chance I'd be willing to take. But knowing that if you re-rent it, the guy that's going to re-rent it is going to going to benefit from me canceling it. Um, it's just the last-minute notice 
a lot of times I think planning an event, usually, like I said, a lot of our events are planned in this building 12, 12 months out. So again, it's an incentive that gets on in here last minute. Okay. Is it? Yep. Vice Mayor Rhino. I have a few questions. First section is section C, trash not emptied fee. Have we always done that where we exclude businesses that they don't have to empty their trash? A lot of times um, it's trying to get the incentive for the business community to come in here. They're not drinking, I mean, if it's a business meeting, a large amount of alcohol and the burden it puts on the building. So it's kind of that extra service that a business wants. Um, when we've worked with like Walmart and all that, they kind of say, well, we'll guess we'll take our trash out. Um, it's not a ton of trash compared to a rental um, on a Friday or Saturday night. So just trying to find a little extra ways to incentivize and try to get in um, more businesses in here during the week. So that's a, a new addition to our policy. If they don't empty the, the renter, if they don't rent, yes, it is. That is, yes. <coughs> okay, and then I have um, questions on section E. Why do we want to give the computer lab five copies of free printing every day? I mean, every person that's in there, five copies free. Um, we're going away, um, we're trying to end um, accepting cash. Um, part of it is, is staff are here by themselves. And one thing we thought of, the computer lab's use has dropped tremendously over those last couple years, staff tell me, and it's a way to get away from having cash in the drawer for employee safety um, and stuff. Um, so we thought five copies a day wasn't burden. Um, also, we could just take that out and they can go print it at the library, too. Um. Or we could do what Staples used to do and they could purchase ahead of time so many copies mm -hmm. on a card. And we can do that, too, yes. Um, they can purchase Because when you, when you talk about doing away with cash and using credit cards, if, for for different chart for different rentals, does the city pay for someone to use a credit card? We do about a one point four percent rate from Visa, Mastercard. If I'm correct, Suzanne. The nice thing about that is that it goes into our account. It's uh, um, they can do that online now, pay their rental fees. And they don't have to come into the building, so it's very convenient when they use their credit card. That it gives them access to do stuff online. That's does and, the, and, and give them a quicker refund instead of four weeks two to three days if they class gets canceled or they want a refund. The computers at the library, do they get free copies? They don't. Okay. So we, we probably shouldn't if even the library isn't offering it. Um, the issue or what you brought up about the recreation manager establishing new fees, do we have any other manager that we allow to set up new fees without coming to the city council, Mr. Wells? Well, any, any fee is required to have a public hearing. So um, if it falls under within this um, umbrella, um, it would be required to be back at the council. Um, just depends on the, the structure, what you're talking about. Uh, from a contracting program, it's a little different than a, um, than, a, than a fee that we're setting here this evening. Okay, but it says recreation manager can establish new fees that are offered between August of 2019 and June of 2022. Sure. And we currently that. don't allow that. It's under Section E, Recreation Programs and Services, page... Program, not staff report. Item, right? item 12. It's in a staff report. Part of that, I don't see a lot of new staff operating programs or that fall under if they did we could get something established if the community wants something quickly up or you know something need to change I wouldn't change already the fees here that are in the report it would just be hey we want to offer this new program and we want staff driven that comes from the council or city or from the residents that we can set that up quickly um, and you know it's far and few between I'm thinking really well, I believe the council still should have that come to us. Not likely we would be able to do it without count. It'd be a pretty minimal opportunity where we could go that route. Most most examples I'm thinking of would require council approval. Okay. I well, I would like to strike that then, okay. that it still would come to the council. 
My other question on section C is, nope, it's not under, it's not under E. It would be under F. And that is the city clerk solemnization of marriages. We have a $15 witness fee, optional only if a witness is needed. Well, why do we just do away with that and require at the time that they come in that they bring their own witness? Can we do that? Most people do have their own witness, um, but when I met with the county, um, they had invited me to perform marriage ceremonies with them. They said there is an instance where time to time someone does not have a witness and they usually have to find someone to come in um, be a witness. But then that involves finding a staff person and increasing a staff time to find a, a witness, correct? You're correct, so I can make that a requirement. That would be fine. I would like to see it be a requirement so we don't incur any, any more staff time on it. Okay, go for it. I have another question on section E. The Get Fit series, the monthly membership, what is that? Right now we offer like um, Zuma classes and it was $40 a month for twice a week. And the cost of that, um, right now the staff to teach it um, and the amount, uh, the price of the class was deterring people from using it. So we developed a new program, hopefully get more people in the class that made it more affordable and it's a membership, monthly membership fee. So they can go to five different classes a week, it's a yoga class, um, a Zumba class, um, a boot camp class, and then the each month. And so it's $15 for anyone under 55, and it's $10 for anyone over 55. So, um, and that's part of to get more people more involved and the class is more full. Again, I can go join a gym for 40 bucks and get a pool and you know all the equipment and a locker room. So. We just really need to be more competitive and also provide a service that's healthy for the community and opportunity. It's been well received um, and it makes it a lot easier for us scheduling too. Does that exclude the Young at Heart? Young at Heart is free, um, so it, it excludes that. So this is separate from Young at Heart. This is um, Young at Heart and some of the other programs we're offering for seniors are free. This would be um, $10 a month. So Young at Heart would be separate. Thank you. Councilmember Condit? I just wanted to make a comment uh, that I echo the comments made by my two colleagues and the concerns dealing with the plan so far and that I would like to see those changes made in moving forward. Any other comments? Yeah, just real quick. <clears throat> and again, I know you're gonna probably bring this back to us. Is, is that correct, Mayor? Well, I don't know. I think if, if there's a motion passed with the suggested changes, then they wouldn't. Okay. You know, I'd kind of like to see what the other costs are. I mean, I still believe I, our community center costs are pretty cheap compared to the size of the space, the kitchen, the parking, and everything. I think we could look at this and just find, you know, well, I disagree with this, or, you know, I'm not an expert in community centers by any means. Um, but it's, it's a place to start somewhere, right? I mean, because our fees have still been low and obviously with the change of minimum wage going up, um, it's one of those things. I do agree with Council Member Klein in regards to the lost deposit somehow. It says it's one to three months out, like they lose their deposit, half of it, within one to three months. I think that's kind of long, but at the same time, too, I understand why you have that, because what happens is if I could get a venue cheaper and I didn't read the fine print knowing that I'd lose my deposit, then maybe I'd go someplace else. So we're losing that revenue. I completely get that. $9,000 when this thing is losing 120 or whatever that number is every year is a lot of money, right? So this place will only be losing $111,000, whatever the case is. Um, but you know, I, I think this is a good start, and you know, you have to you have to begin somewhere. I know we changed this. I think in 2016, we we, we changed the fees. 2017. It? it was yeah, 2017. 2017, 2016, 2017. Um, that you know, I, I I could agree with most of this. So. Okay. At this time, I'll open it up to the public. Is there anyone in the audience that would like to speak on this item?
Don. I uh, have an old deal here for Series Youth Basketball Association, Series Youth Soccer. Down at the bottom, it's got the Series Hawks res Wrestling, Tri-County Smash, Series Shock Basketball, Series Youth Basketball Program, Series Gotham Swim Team. They're all gone. They're all gone. Parks and Recreation has them no more. And you know, whenever I was running the basketball program, it's not how much I could make on the kids. It's what I could do for the kids for the least amount of money. I can figure that out. I've got 200 kids, I've got this much money, I can get so many referees. And with all these teams and the recreation, it, 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 it's, you know, I'm just absolutely astonished. I, I, just, I just can't believe that we can't do something without charging every time that the kids, and now the kids, all they're doing is sitting home doing this. A lot of them can't even afford to come. I, I don't care if it's $10 or $15. We have to do something for the kids to get them away from the living room and get them out doing something. This is aggravating to me. Aggravating. You have to do more for the kids so they can come up and be something, except a, a computer with in, inside. We got to get them out and get them playing. The baseball fields is locked up. My kids used to go down there and play Indian every weekend. Now they can't even do that. They can't play at the basketball, like Carol Fowler. They can't do that anymore. Well, we can bring them down to the community center and charge them $50 to play. Come on, let's do something for the kids. Let's, let's get something going for them. Good evening, uh, sorry. My name is Adam Bolanos. I am the president of Series F Earthquake FC. And I just wanna talk about the soccer fields. A couple years ago, <laughs> so a couple years ago, uh, the city increased the field fees from $12 to $30 per hour. A lot of uh, teams that I support are low income. We, we, we pay for the fields, for games, for practice. And the thought process was we're going to charge the same as other cities are charging. But at that point, the conditions of the field were not the same. I can bring you pictures of Turlock, Modesto, Pristine with goals, nets, everything. So it was a big increase for our club, the amount of fees, the amount they went up, even for practice. A lot of our teams went outside to the parks. Some of them could afford it, stayed renting, and we do rent the fields. So every time there's an increase in fields, it affects our teams. We've got 24 teams, competitive teams, nonprofit organization, and our goal is to get kids in competitive soccer so they can go to college, get a scholarship. The only reason I'm here today is because, you know, Matt invited me to the meeting. Just consider this. As a team that rents the fields, every time there's an increase, it affects our club, it affects our parents, it affects our players. We pay for everything, nonprofit organization. One of the things that really affected us was a couple years ago when we went from 12 to 30. We had almost all the teams practicing on the complex, and then they disappeared to, to the parks. Now the parks are getting crowded. We get pushed out. I understand maintaining the fields is very important and we're there. But one of the things I want to mention is that our club, we have over 400 kids in our club. 24 teams, numerous parents that volunteer. Most of our coaches do not get paid, they volunteer. And so for us, the soccer complex is a very, very important. We represent the city of Ceres. We bring in outside teams. We bring in teams from the Bay Area, from Sacramento, Fresno. We compete against the best. And every time they say, how can a small city, a series, have such great competitive teams? 
I just want to mention, in closing, seven of our girls, competitive girls, who graduated in May are playing college. And that came from our club. Rec is very important because it's something to do for kids. But the next step for us is how to get that competition to get them involved, get the opportunity to go to college. As, as the president, I just want to say every time you look at field fees and allocation, it impacts us, it impacts our teams. Some of our teams are moving to Mary Grogan because the fields are set up, they got goals, it's lined, and they got fields. And I'm not saying anything bad about Matt. Matt just came in. He's doing an excellent job with Kevin, uh, I think it's Kevin, <laughs> to try to improve the fields. But it was a big impact for us. 12 to 30, we were renting, all of a sudden we couldn't rent. We couldn't afford it. It's the same concept. Every time they increase it, it's gonna, it's, gonna, it's gonna affect our club. One of our plans as a club is we never had a soccer tournament in series. We wanna hold a soccer tournament in series. The number of people that come from the outside bringing in 25 to 30 teams from the outside impacts our business, hotels, you know, food expenses. Not only do I live in series, I'm a small business owner in series. Thank you. Is there anyone else? Okay, I'll close the public hearing and bring it back to Vice Mayor Rhino. Mr. Westbrook, haven't we had problems at the soccer field as far as people were breaking into the locks and maybe our fields were really looking bad, we couldn't maintain them. Wasn't there something going on with the soccer field? Um, there was uh, about a year ago when I when I took over the recreation division uh, with the help of the facilities division and the parks department we kind of mitigated some of those issues um, we still see some things out there uh, but a lot of the teams uh, we met with them a lot of the organizations and they kind of really kind of took to heart some of the things we we're talking about but um, when I was first starting to experiencing I was was seeing field rentals for our soccer complex and going out and seeing all of our fields being used um, people weren't paying for them and so magically the gates got open oh we thought we could be out here is this an issue why is it an issue so um, since that time with the help of the facilities department the earthquake CYSO um, the adult league they've all kind of taken it upon themselves to kind of police out there to make sure that the folks that are out there are supposed to be out there so um, uh, there had been kind of an issue, but I think that a lot of those have been resolved over the course of the last year. Um, again, the Parks Department really kind of stepped up and, and improved the conditions of the field. That was one of the complaints that we had from all of the organizations that were using it. But um, those fees are in place to uh, collect revenues to maintain the fields. And so um, while we would like to sit here, Matt and I, would, and to say that we could have a $12 rate, um, that doesn't come close to covering the cost as it is. And so um, in the best case scenario, we could probably get $50,000 in revenue from field rentals and games, et cetera, um, cost a little bit more to maintain it. So we're still um, subsidizing uh, even a little bit with this increase. Thank you. Okay. Councilmember Condon. Sure. Uh, I tend to agree with the gentleman from the soccer organization and Mr. Donaldson. I definitely don't want to punish the nonprofits or the kids and discourage them by raising these fees. I think there's other alternatives that we could look at to possibly, uh, you know, find lucrative measures. Uh, but I definitely don't want to punish those organizations that do a great service for our city. Councilmember Klein. With these rate increases, are we raising the rate increase for CYB? They have an agreement. Um, so for CYSO, CYB, the gardening club, um, they have currently have agreements with us. The gardening club is coming due in the next couple months to renew the agreement, but they have a set fee structure. CYSO has a set fee structure? They do. They contribute more of this time towards um, the field maintenance and stuff. And they contribute also funds to the parks department to do additional maintenance to the park, or to the fields on top of their fees. That's my address. Yeah, two things. Number one, is that concession stand being used out there? You know, we um, it was 
not getting used much anymore. Um, unfortunately, when we cracked down on the alcohol in the park, um, it kind of got a little crazy um, out there. And when we did that, their revenues really dropped because people didn't hang out as much. Um, so I'm gonna have to sit down with the owner. They kind of take a break during this time um, of the year. And they'll probably definitely be on the, the renter, I mean the leasee, and they'll probably be there for the CISO um, season at least. I just know that we had to restructure some of the stuff at CYB before your time. And you know, the concession stand wasn't making any money really and how that was, I don't know. But you know, now it makes a lot of money. And uh, you know, they kind of restructured uh, part two. Um, I don't feel good, so bear with me. I lost my train of thought on part two. The, I'll come back, I'll come back. Okay, well then, um, are there any other comments of the council? If not, I'll look for direction. I got it, okay. I got it, sorry. Um, you know, I've been in series my whole life. I know all the parks, even the ones that we gotta build. And do we have, uh, maybe you could answer this, Mayor or Toby, because most of the people that use our parks don't live in series, and they're coming from Modesto or Turlock and they're practicing soccer in these areas here. I don't know, this is well known, by the way. Um, is that, is there anything that we can do? Because then there may be space for the gentleman with the earthquakes or whatever to maybe use that park. The city attorney can weigh in here, but um, as we've looked into this in the past, um, it's pretty much next to impossible to uh, enforce that kind of you have to be a resident to use the park. I mean, especially a park that's open to the public, there's really no mechanism for that. For the ones that are renting them, we do have, you know, a two-tier system, right? But it's just a non-profit. It's a resident non-profit rate and then a, um, a commercial. So a, a non-profit club that's not from here would get charged a higher rate. So and de depending on the residency, too, the amount of residents on their team, we're going to bring up policy back to you. Um, after this in a few months is based on the, how many residents play on their teams, they'll get a higher priority. So we'd have like a resident club rate. I mean, they'd get priority on field use first, depending on the re how many residents were in their um, club team. And um, but yeah, very difficult to control well, I just know non residents. C on CYB and baseball, right? CYB and baseball, they would give you a card that you would show that if I, because I coached teams back in the day at Virginia Parks and I could show somebody that, you know, I'm using this facility, look, this is what they gave me, this the CYB to be able to use the facility, you know. Could it be that to, to just, to, if they're gonna practice here, I just see them, we're tearing our grass, we're paying for the water of the park, and it's a club team from Turlock that's coming in with no, zero players that live in Ceres or Modesto area, like where I live. Yeah, again, at River Bluff, we have controls on it with the mechanisms in place, but for the regular parks, there's no controls on those um, those spaces. They're first come, first serve, and it is really difficult um, to find some way to regulate a, an existing park that is public. It is open to the public, and that definition is not city residents only. Right. All right. Okay. Are there any other co questions or comments? If not, I will entertain a motion or direction. But I, can I say one thing? Sure. But I think to go along with what Council Member DeRosset said, if we had series teams that wanted to practice, say at Don Pedro, because that used to be a real popular place, couldn't they have a card that we gave them that said, you know, we have this reserved because we're a series team, and then if there's somebody else playing, they can say we have it reserved? Is that possible or not? In, it's possible, but in practicality, it's pretty difficult who they show on the card to and showing it to another team, whether that has any weight. Um, you know, we don't have. Then we have soccer monitors. people getting into fights and. Yeah, yeah. I mean, okay. that, that's been known to happen. Um, you know, we, we'd like to think that uh, people would be respectful of that, but we've got a number of situations where that doesn't necessarily occur. So. Um, it's, it's difficult with the staffing level that we have to have somebody out there policing the parks uh, in that, that use activity. It's, it is definitely a challenge. Okay, what's the will of the council?
I move to adopt resolution number 201987 with the changes mentioned by council member Klein and myself. Second. Do we have a motion and a second? Can we have the roll call vote, please? Council member Condit? Nay. Council member DeRosset? Yes. Vice Mayor Rhino? Yes. Council member Klein? Yes. And Mayor Vieira? No. Motion passes 3 2. Okay. Thank you. All right. Um, we will move to discussion items. Uh, first one is item 13, the strike team discussion. Mr. Wise? Yes, please. Uh, good evening, Mayor and City Council. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here this evening to uh, do a discussion on uh, the strike team and uh, mutual aid. I'd like to start off tonight's presentation with two short videos that give a, a good background of uh, uh, statewide mutual aid and uh, the reason for mutual aid in California. The first video is from the Office of Emergency Services. We did test this earlier, it did work. Thank you. 
automatically without having to ask. And then from the state level, as it, as it explained, you're helping other jurisdictions that need help and they're trying to meet it. 
state of California is broken down into six mutual aid plans. Here are in region four and the right on the photo that says that are in it are the three hills. Light and green hills. So uh, as the video alluded to also, the types of disasters that could call for mutual or mutual aid, statewide mutual aid, of course fires, floods, earthquakes, and hazardous materials. How is mutual aid requested? The ten resources at the local level are overwhelmed by a man in need of action. So again, in the, the example I just gave about the Syria Fire Department needing help. Well, if our resources locally become overwhelmed, we gradually increase what we ask for. So uh, the folks that have depleted our resources Wells County, which is called an operation effort. Then we would look towards our region. So region four would be Aspen for that. And if the incident needs to grow larger, at that point, we go to statewide mutual aid. So in, in the video, they talked about different types of resources. They gave the example of the strike team. And what could be made up of the strike team is the type one engine, which is our normal everyday out state, uh, type one engine. Um, generally, the request it was four, per or four, four personnel. A type three engine is called a bus locally with four personnel, a type six engine. Grass rig like a grass rig personnel. Or they could call for specific uh, positions to help out on their incident. And one, one thing they didn't mention in the video is the strike team. With every strike team, there's a strike team leader that goes with that strike team of engines. They're usually in a battalion, like a battalion crew or a bus, and they're the engine. Or they could call for a public information. Our personnel is a public information officer of TMD. Or a line EMT, which uh, in our personnel are certified as line, line EMT. Those line EMTs go to the incident and they support as assistance for on that incident. The California Fire Assistance Plan. This is, this is our, our agreement and how we get reimbursed for fire emergency assistance. California and federal resources. So it used to be called the five party agreement. There's now seven parties agreement agreement with it, including state and federal uh, entities that host it contract. It's, it's the mechanism of how we get reimbursed for our personnel and our apparatus costs. With the reimbursement of our personnel and our apparatus costs, we do get an administrative fee. That administrative fee is per year at a minimum of 10%. So our costs for our personnel, our costs for our apparatus, what we get for those, and then they put a 10% fee on top of that. Now that through an analysis process, that can be increased, but the minimum amount is 10%. Next year, we'll be looking at doing an analysis and see if we're eligible for that increase. As I mentioned, the CURF, the agreement currently under negotiation. Last I told the federal government was uh, being a little tough on that. They didn't want to reimburse the government and they had a few other things, but uh, I think I think they're going to keep status quo. The 2017 Syria Fire Department responded to four statewide mutual aid events. Uh, after a review was conducted by Sipa, the reimbursement of the Syria Fire was a net positive, and that's an approximate number. It hasn't been audited by our finance, but he did work with our finance. Uh, so the types of mutual aid requests that come down from the state when statewide mutual aid is requested. It's important to know the difference between these. The initial attack response is when they call. Uh, this is generally when life, life is in danger, the property is in danger. And Generally, most of the time, when they call for initial attack, they, they uh, usually a county nearby or contiguous. The exception is Paradise, uh, the campfire last year, they requested initial attack from resources all over no Northern California. Uh, and then uh, with initial attack, you have five minutes to be on the road once they make that. Immediate need to report, uh, they respond within 30 minutes. So you have a 30 minutes to get on the road and get to a rendezvous point. So we were headed north, we went to Salida, we were headed south, we moved uh, to a rest stop in Turlock. Our planning, 
generally planning, you have quite a bit of time, maybe up to two to three days notice. And usually this is for relief or plan relief on, for an incident where they need additional resources and it's been a long duration, you've got plenty of time. So the requirements to participate in mutual aid, not everybody, not every department can participate. Your, your personnel have to be certified and qualified. Whether you're under the California Incident Command Certification System, our personnel, they have to take courses, they have to have experience, they have to go through what's called RT-130, arduous training, before they can be certified and qualified and they, they are assigned a red card each year. Our, even our apparatus has to meet certain standards. Requirements for the command system, so for the typing and the certification. Our apparatus, we are refunded on a per hour basis on our apparatus, and it's based off of the type of apparatus and the amount of water that it can pump. Also, you know, the requirements to participate in strike team. As a fire chief, my first and foremost goal is always to protect the city of Seattle. And once we get the call for a strike team, I have to ensure that our city will be covered and our stations will be protected. Now that's not a, a static situation, that's a dynamic si situation based on time of year, what we have going on. So for example, say if we have people on workers' comp, we have a lot of people on vacation, we look at it, we forecast it, uh, we know we're gonna have trouble trying to backfill our station. So the request would be for because you have to be able to cover. Second is on some incidents, it's not 100% reimbursed. For me, as fire chief, if they're not gonna reimburse our city 100% of our costs, we're not going, then head chief won't handle it. So with that, I know that was a quick overview of the statewide mutual aid system. Uh, with that, if you have any additional questions. Councilmember Condit. Okay. Uh, so Chief Wise, so um, potentially the city could net some revenue from these strike teams, potentially, or at very least break even. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah, there's, there's potential there for revenue, but I think the intent is to recover our costs and make our, our city. At very least, yeah. Okay. Uh, so if we were to net some revenue, uh, where would that revenue go? It goes into the general fund. Okay, it goes to the general. Okay, so is it true that uh, the Modesto Fire Department netted half a million dollars last year from these strike teams, is that? I, I've heard that number, but I could. Okay. Um, so what is the lifespan of the equipment we use for our department? Generally our, our type one engines, we can get 10 years of first out service. All of ours are over 10 years. Um, and generally we, we keep them in their status for about 10 years. Yeah. Okay, and is that the same with our, the apparatus as well as about 10 year lifespan for apparatus? Generally, that's what we, we try to look at, is that being a first out piece of apparatus for 10 years, I'd like to put it in reserve. That's what your goal is. Okay. Well, uh, Chief, I mean, uh, do you think it would be a wise decision if, um, if we were to potentially net revenue from these strike teams to maybe set a percentage aside that would be dedicated towards uh, equipment and eventual apparatus replacement in the future? Sure. sure. Okay. Thank you. I would make that recommendation that if we do decide to do this, that we would dedicate a portion of the funds that the city could potentially receive towards it, uh, equipment exchange and apparatus replacement. Thank you. Councilmember Klein. Chief Wise, I know that I ask you a lot of questions to take care of, but I'm looking at this because I was asking for a little bit more in depth of you know what the thing was. You gave me an overview. So with this overview on expenses, does that include all our backfill, out of classification, everything else? Yes, sir. And I know you, you probably haven't had a chance to look at it. I sent you the packet this afternoon here on the third copy. So you have well, uh, yeah, but I, you know, I was, uh, we'll talk later because I wanted a little bit more in depth, yep. you know. So, but the expenses, that, in, that does include all the backfill over time? Yes, sir. Okay. Vice Mayor Rhino. <laughs> 
thought when we had this issue come up before, we found out that the reimbursement did not necessarily cover all of the backfill, Mr. Wells. The information I'm passing down is the information that uh, Chief Wise had supplied to, to Council Member Klein today. Um, prior to tw 2017, we had really hadn't done a real in-depth analysis on a, on a per-incident basis. And as a result of the conversations from 2015, 2016, um, Chief Serfa took it upon himself to really do the analysis, um, to, to look into that, to substantiate that, that situation of whether we are recovering our costs or not. And I think uh, from the information they're getting, it's unaudited information. So, you know, can I, with all certainty, say it's $111,959? No, but it's an order of magnitude that both Chief Wise and myself are completely comfortable saying, yes, our participation in the strike teams, it covers our costs, and there's likely some revenue that could be allocated to some other need. But uh, this is some detail there if you'd like us to, you know, really dig into it. But we do believe it covers um, basically the the bulk of the information that covers the cost of both the employees participating in the strike team as well as the folks that are filling their shifts here. So that, that is captured in the detail there. And we've talked previously about um, any monies we got back from the state going towards an apparatus replacement. Isn't that correct? That's correct. That Because that had not been done. That's not been the, correct. In the past, we've been in a, a different financial position. and. Any revenue we need got in, we really needed from our general fund. Um, I think we're in a better position financially now that that would be our recommendation from a staff perspective to allocate that to the apparatus replacement fund. Didn't we already give direction on that, or did uh, we just briefly talk about it? It's been discussed. It? it has not. That direction has not been given. And the vehicles or the apparatus that would be sent would that be our new vehicles that are being built? Yes. So we haven't even paid them off, but we're going to send them off into some raging wildfire, correct? Yes. Okay. And this happened before you came on board, but I can remember, and I don't know if the rest of you can, but someone from the fire union coming before us and begging us to um, help alleviate the overtime that they were having to work that was taking them away from their families. And my concern is, is that at that time, they were so concerned about overtime taking them away from their families. And this was overtime just covering the city of Ceres. What makes it different that they want to be sent away on a strike team and then there's going to be overtime? I mean, they, he stood right there and, and was very upset that they were working so much overtime. So I'm not sure that I understand why now if they went out on a strike team, the overtime is okay, but when it was just to cover series, it was a, it was a problem. We are at is, a there a, is there a difference in? Yeah, we are at a different staffing level now too. We do have full staffing today that we didn't have at that point in time as well. Okay. And there was a bit more going on at that point in time, but staffing levels are at full budgeted allocation today and was not the case then. We did have a few injuries and other, other things that were going on with vacancies that were um, but couldn't that happen? To that. But couldn't that happen now as Absolutely. well? Absolutely, but as, as Chief Weiss indicated, if that's the case, then we're not going. And, so and if that's we part of that ongoing evaluation, that daily evaluation of our our current status with with work injuries, people off duty, uh, currently on vacation, expected vacations, we have to forecast and work out. And it's it's not just a static answer every day. It's something that we have to look at and evaluate. And I know that we can always, if if we send a strike team, and we had a situation in series, we're going to depend on our resource sharing partners to step in, but. What if all of them have sent strike teams as well? What does that do to our community for coverage? I mean, do you know that, that before you would say yes, that some other station in Modesto or a couple in Modesto have sent somebody, so then you would know whether, how that would affect us? Yeah, but they would, they would be just like us. They backfill their stations to where their stations are fully staffed. But 
I guess it's hard for me to understand if everybody is sending strike teams, how much backfilling can you do? I mean, if everybody is sending them, it seems like you'd be running out of staff. Yeah, th um, most agencies are just like what I recommend and what I said that, that we as a fire chief, before I can send an engine out of county is that we would have proper backfill for our department and, and forecasted backfill also. From a, a numbers perspective for an agency like ours, 30 or so line staff, Modesto with hundreds, um, you know, a strike team generally is going to be three or four people, sometimes five, but that magnitude for Modesto to send a strike team doesn't overly impact their overall ability to staff their shifts. Um, you know, it's obviously a different magnitude. So, you know, that is one of the beauties of the resource sharing arrangement is, you know, we have a commitment and a contractual obligation to ensure that we're providing that level um, of service between the, the agency. And we currently have no OES equipment or staff. No, no, we don't. Um, and I'll just touch on that briefly in case um, everybody doesn't understand the OES engine system. So OES will supply your department with an engine, a type one, a type three, or a type six. And Modesto is currently uh, has a hazmat rig, a type two hazmat rig. Now with that comes conditions. Now you can use that engine as a reserve engine. So when your first out engine goes down, you can use that engine on a daily basis. However, when they call, you have to go. You don't have a choice. That's, that's the strings attached when they give you an engine but they're giving you a $600,000 engine to use. But the strings are, when you call, when they call, you have to go. Thank you. You're welcome. Councilmember Drossett. Can we get one of those engines? I mean. Yeah, okay. yeah, it, uh, it's definitely possible. You know, talking with the firefighters for as many years as they've been doing this, you know, one of the things that we kind of lacked in is to g give them an opportunity to have a chance to do something maybe not, well, that's different, right? So if we have strike teams, or we have that ability here in the city of Ceres, we're maybe likely to keep more people around to a certain degree. And I know the staffing numbers have definitely changed. Um, it's, a, it's a reimbursement, so it takes a while to get to us, but I think all the years that, that I've been sitting up here, we've always made the money, whether it been a dollar or $111,000 in one route or another. Um, I'm not a firefighter, and I know that Toby Wells did a 24-hour course, and he was a firefighter chief there for a while. And one of the things that I'm going to make a suggestion on, and I know I'm probably not going to win this one, is but this, this should be your call. I mean, every year that we are up here, and I know that you're new, that you know, we have to get permission to give to the firefighters to go out. There's three tiers. There's a five-minute tier. they got to know in five minutes, right, if something's burning down. Well, you know, by the time Toby sends me an email or a text, it might be 30 minutes before I get back to him. We've already lost that window for that. And I know you're probably not aware we hadn't had this conversation. I know I've had it with Toby quite a bit. But you're the expert. You're the chief that we hired. You look at the numbers. You see, yes, we have backfill. You see, yes, we have the equipment. Uh, you know, things are good right now, right? At least within our city, we know that the resources, everything else, you know, I, I, you're probably not aware of this, or maybe you are, you know, but we're coming up to fire season, and we're having this conversation, and are we going to have this conversation every year? I mean, I'm, I'm just saying, you know. I mean, it, it's, it's, it's kind of like he needs to do his job. We don't need to micromanage, right? Anyways. Yeah, the, in the past, the conversation, well, the, the council had given clear direction to not participate in strike teams um, unless on a very specific case-by-case -case situation where um, basically the phrase that was used was the calling all cars comes out for something that is relatively close, and that's the system that we've been using for the last uh, several years. Obviously, uh, for about 18 months when I was the city manager and the fire chief, it was, it was one call, um, but checking with three council members or, you know, all council members to see if they would support for sending the strike team. So that is the direction that was given, and that's what we're still operating under. So if council wants to change that direction, um, we would be fully supportive of that. We do, um, from an operations standpoint, obviously time is of the essence, but again, council sets the policy and the direction for us. If you would like us to continue the status quo, that's what we will continue, unless you give us direction otherwise. Well, as a reminder, the reason that we took that action was because unlike what Councilmember Condit said, when the revenue came in, it was not 
set aside for engine replacement or anything else. It was used for salaries and everything else. And when we went 10 years down the road, our equipment was beat to heck and we had nothing to show for it. And so, you know, for me to support this, the money will have to go 100% into replacement of the equipment that we are using and abusing as part of this. And we don't funnel it off and use it for other things. I mean, I'm the first one to say we need to help our neighbors out. But when the economy got difficult and there was, you know, whether you laid people off or whatever, we diverted that money and that was what happened. So that was why we got to the point where we said, it's great to help out, you know, our neighbors, but when we're helping out somebody all at the north end of the state and the money comes in and it gets squandered away for other things and then we end up having to buy $2 million worth of equipment and we didn't have the money, we're taking loans, so I, I, I can support it, but again, the money that is coming into us to support that has to be used for that. And, that, and that's just... And, and that's opinion. what I'm proposing, and proposing to give Chief Wise the authority to follow through on these strike teams. Mm -hmm. Councilmember Klein? Well, first off, uh, the, uh, Vice Mayor Rhino, I, I do remember the conversation we had uh, about one firefighter, and I know exactly who it was, that came forward and said they're tired of overtime, okay? Uh, and granted, Mr. Wells is correct, we were down two or three people in staff, you know, but, you know, he, he did voice his opinion on how irritant he was with having to pick work overtime, et cetera. So, you know, with that being said, I, 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 do, I do remember that conversation. Uh, the second thing is, with Council Member DeRosset, I do agree with you, but I think we need to set some parameters. So our truck is not going down to San Diego right. or up to Weed. We need to set some parameters. I can see it, Santa Cruz, you know, within a certain jurisdiction. Uh, the other thing is, is Chief Wise, I know I ask you a lot of questions. I want to thank you very much for this report because I can remember probably for the last five years, I've asked for something similar to this, even though the money goes back into the general fund. But I've asked for something like this, so at least we can justify where the overtime budget was. When it was $300,000, we knew we got $200,000 of it from a strike team, so we can justify it. So I wanna thank you for this report. Uh, I know it was, I, I put a lot on you, at the last minute, but this is what I'd asked for for three or four years when we were going to strike teams because that money was going back into the general fund and now you tell me how much we're getting back for, for apparatus. So in line with the mayor says, now we at least know we can justify, you know, the expense that we're, we're occurring. So, uh, you know, I know this is a discussion item. I know it's gonna come back but I would like to see it come back as a, uh, on the agenda with some parameters as far as what, where the strike team can go and what they can do without having to go to council for approval, okay? But, uh, you know, with that being said, you know, I also want the fire department to understand that like in an OSE rig, there's, there's, there's strings attached. Don't come back here and say, we don't want the overtime and complain about everything when you're fully staffed and, and we're going back in the direction that it should be, you know? Because, you know, I'll tell you right now, I was one that was offended, you know, for the, for the direction and the things that they did in the past. You know, I'm not gonna hide it. I was offended and I told more than one of them that. You know, I admire the things they do for the city uh, and, and the other things, but you know, when they're gonna come up here and, and complain about something and then get mad because they can't go on strike teams, they got to be careful what they wish for. So I can support going back on strike teams with some parameters in place. And in the future, on every, every incident that we do go, I hope you put this report together. You know, when the money comes in, at least we can, we can go in a direction that Council Member Condit wants, that the mayor, mayor says, and what I've been asking for for the last four or five years. So I thank you very much. Vice Mayor Rhino. I would agree as well, and I agree that we need to have parameters, and I think we need to give you the opportunity to run your department. 
But I also would like to see that if we do send, with parameters, as Council Member Klein said, but if we do send a strike team, I would at some point when we've received our monies, I would like a financial report, but I would like it to be audited by the finance department to be sure that all of the whatever has to be taken into account has been actually accounted for. And I agree as well that we need to be sure that we do the replacement so we don't get stuck where we are now with really aging apparatus and we had no way to pay for it. Okay, at this time I'll open it up for a comment from anyone in the public that would like to speak on this item. Uh, Dave Prattis, Surrey's. Yes, I, th every time you talk about it, it goes in the general fund, I, and then you, but when you have that extra money, you spend it, and then like you say, down the road when you need an engine or two, then you gotta borrow money from somewhere else. And so basically you're better off, I know Modesto, they have allowance, that they know that they gotta replace equipment 10, 15 years down the road, they have that money to pay for that. It's not that 10, uh, 10 or 15 years down the road and they, and you don't have that money because it went in the general fund and they, gen they spent the money in general fund. So yes, I think any extra money that you get should go towards future, because like you said, when you send an engine down the road, you're putting a lot of extra wear and tear on that, on, on that and it may not even last 10 years. And you may be looking sooner. Thank you. And just to clarify once again, and maybe De Ms. Dean can correct me if I'm wrong, the general fund is the public safety fund. Within that, there are separate buckets. So please don't say the money goes into the general fund and it doesn't get used for public safety, because that's not true. It does. It's just not for that specific item. So. So it, it's not going to the water guys, it's not going to the sewer guys, it's going to the public safety people. So just to clarify that. So when we say general fund, it isn't general in nature, it covers public safety. So. Well, then, then, then yeah, Mr. Mayor, could you clarify why you don't support the strike team fund, the money we get from the strike teams going into Yeah, because fund. that money was diverted to either salaries for public safety people. So it could be used for other things. It could be okay. used for other things, but only, clarification. In that, only in that public safety area. It can't be used for, a, you know, a streets worker that's doing the sewer or. All right, so base, base of that money, you're, but you're still not saving money for that engine that you're looking at down the road. Correct, and that's what we're saying is within the general fund, yeah, the we general would want fund, that money to yeah. only be used for that, and it couldn't be used for anything else. Well, the same thing, thing with uh, the money that you get for like the fireworks, that, that extra money coming in there should be go towards maybe hiring more people looking, looking for the illegal fireworks. Now, instead of having four people looking for fireworks, then maybe next year you could have six. Well, that's a, li that's a little hard because they only look for fireworks for two weeks and we, I don't think we'd hire somebody for two weeks or a month or whatever, but, but I get your point. So again, I, I just want for clarification, well, you know, the right. general so fund is not this, this thing that goes everywhere. It goes right where we want it to go. It's just we need to provide more specifics for that. Yeah, that's right. You need the more specifics, but you put it in there for the year and you spend it for that year, then there's nothing left for down the road when, like you, when you need, need something. Then you forced to borrow money from somebody else. So. It's better if it's going out for safety or, or fire, uh, for fire, or, uh, for police or fire, or when you, when the police car gets, ri uh, gets run over by another drunk driver or something, something that you got money for another police car. And, and the last thing I would say is, just because it went in the general fund and it didn't go to engine replacement, wasn't necessarily a bad thing. Because if I were to sit there and say, would you use that money to keep a firefighter or to keep it to replace an engine? You might tell me I'd rather keep a firefighter on staff. 
So just, just so that you're aware, when this money comes in, it wasn't that it was a bad thing that it was used for. It just wasn't for this specific area. So again, just, I mean, when we move down the road here five years from now and the economy gets a little more difficult and there's that funding sitting there, I want to remind everybody that we said we're taking that funding just for engine replacement and it's not necessarily for staff or anything else. So just, to, just so you understand how that works. It's in the general fund, but we're specifically saying what it has to be used for, and we aren't giving them the latitude to use it in other areas. So just, just, just for qualification. John Warren series. <clears throat> if a strike team is needed in Humboldt County and we have the resources to send a strike team there and everything is fine in our series in our in our city in our city, then we should send a strike team to Humboldt County. The same thing with San Diego. Uh, I don't think that we need to restrict mutual aid to our own designated area. I understand the concept behind that, but funds come in for those resources. And I believe the city council is going to change the direction that those funds be specifically earmarked for a certain purpose within the general fund, a little pocket over here to be used to replace that equipment down the road uh, when it's needed to be replaced. On the firework issue again, we get $58,000 or whatever the money is gonna come from the revenue from the fines when it eventually arrives in the general fund, which is where it's gonna go, it needs to be earmarked for overtime for the next year so we can hire a couple extra people for two weeks or pay some of our own people overtime to go out and look rather than having four, now we got six or seven, as well as maybe a regional con uh, concept. So I think we don't need to restrict those resources that we have if they're gonna help other people in the state of California when it's necessary. But we do need to earmark those funds that come back to us when we have the monies to be set aside specifically for the replacement of those fire engines going down the road. And I agree with you, uh, Mayor Vieira. Anyone else? Uh, Don. Uh, here we go back into Vietnam, Da Nang, Anthoi, darkened ship. You're working, you're under watch for 30 some hours at a, at a time. 11 cents an hour. You don't ask the captain if you get double time. You got a job to do. Some of these people are over there for a year and a half, two years at a time. I feel proud of the fire department and the de police department. We have to have them. Whatever it costs, we, we have to have them. If I can't trust him, I don't know why you hired him. If I give somebody a job, I want them to do the job. I want to trust them. That's what we hire people for. If they can't do the job, I have no doubt that he's not gonna be a good person to handle this. Give him, uh, being on a ship and running out of an OBA. That's an oxygen breathing apparatus. Have you ever tried to fight a fire without that thing on your face? How can you fight a fire if you don't have a truck to get you there? There are certain things that you have to give the police and the fire. You have to put out the fire and you have to catch the crook. And this has really got me dumbfounded, really. When you started taxes back in the 1800s, you taxed for the police and you taxed for the fire to have people. You didn't tax for the city workers, you didn't tax for the engineers, you didn't tax the institute that you taxed for. So the first thing that comes out of my tax money should be for the fire and the police. First thing, I don't care what else you have, that should come out of it first. Because you don't have nothing if everything, just like 
in Reading or wherever that fire was, you don't have nothing if everything burns up. So that's, that's, that's where I'm at. The fire and the police gets the first chunk of the money, bar none. Nobody else gets paid until they get paid. And I don't know if it's two and a half police officers or firemen for every 10,000. You know how many people you need. Okay, thank you. Ms. Dean? Um, I just wa wanted to verify that, yes, what you said is correct. The, the bulk of the general fund is for um, police and fire. And we do set aside money in our internal service funds for equipment re replacement. Um, the only thing we don't set aside um, is currently for the large apparatus. And there have been discussions on how to address that issue. Um, but uh, the city has faced a lot of financial stress since everything crashed back in the um, mid-2000s. And that is why there is nothing um, being set aside. So uh, when someone crashes a police car, we have the money set aside. We just paid for three new vehicles uh, that needed to be replaced. So we are doing those proactive things. It's just the large apparatus that we're not. Okay, anyone else? All right, I'll bring it back to the council. Now, this is not um, an item, so I, it's a discussion item. Are you intending to bring this back to us, or do you want the direction now? Because I think what I'm hearing, and I'll kind of try to summarize this here, and the council can tell me if I'm wrong, that we're supportive of the strike teams. Um, we want to make sure that the return funding that we get goes into buckets that are only used for replacement of the equipment. I'm not sure where we stand with what our radius would be or do we want it opened it up for all of California. I think there's still a little discussion there. Um, and then I don't know at this point that we would all need to be um, polled if an activity came. We're giving you the latitude to make that decision. So I think the only thing that I'm still not clear on is do we want to put a parameter as to how far we go or do we want to leave it to their discretion? I think we need to come back to the proposal. Okay. Is that, were you guys intending to come back to us? So this what? is a request from council to have this discussion. So we, we know what the direction has been in the past. So if so we, we keep brought this as information, looking for council's direction. If you want to leave status well, why don't quo, you do this? Good. Why don't you take with what you have now, come back to us with that summary and what you might recommend as far as the strike team you know area and then that'll probably be the last thing that we have to discuss if you'd like to see that policy as well in terms of how the revenue comes back in as correct. part of that same package correct okay. and i would still like to see a report afterwards we, we would build that yes. into the policy that okay. would be part of that resolution yes. of designated the funding source and we'll, we'll put that in a in a report to say here here's if we participate in a strike team here's how it works Here's what we'll report on. Put some time frames in there so you have a resolution or a policy of some sort to give us a clear answer. Yeah, this only works if the accounting of everything makes us whole, even if we have overtime on our end, excuse me, backfilling those that go on the strike team, right. for instance. So in that, in that case, we, we would bring this policy to be able to delineate that. So just Correct. for a round number, if $50,000 comes back in, we want to make sure that the general fund where those overtime revenues came out of is made whole, right. and then whatever is left over is then allocated to the right. to that fund. And there, I, mean, I, I I love our neighbors, and I well I don't really care for the state of California, but <laughs> I sure don't want our residents bearing the burden of us going to a firefighter in the northern border, and we have all this overtime that we're doing, and we spend seventy five thousand, and the state gives us fifty. I mean, that creates a shortfall for us that makes us have to go back out to our public here in series and ask for more money to fund our operation. And I don't think that's fair. I think at a bare minimum, we need to cover our costs for what we're expending to go help someone. And I'm not sure that that's been the case, but this accounting will actually provide us with that information. So, okay. All right, that's the direction you need. So. With that, do we want to take a five-minute break before we uh, dive into the City of Sirius Municipal Code revision discussions? 
So I have a feeling that's going to be a rather lengthy discussion. Yeah. Yeah. All right, so why don't we do this? We'll, uh, we'll re-adjourn at um, 8.25. restarted. Um, the next item is the City of Series Municipal Code Revision Discussion. Mr. Wells. Thank you, Mayor Vieira. Uh, as uh, the Council recalls, we looked at this item uh, back in June and created a schedule where we get started on reviewing uh, the entire uh, Municipal Code. Obviously a very large endeavor and in your package is several hundred pages of documents uh, for your review. Uh, and seeing as the hour of 8.30 um, I, I, we had uh, expected this conversation to probably take about an hour and a half um, to get through these six sections that are here this evening. So uh, if council is inclined, we can start powering through this and get through a couple. Or if you're more uh, comfortable pushing this off to the next meeting, we can we can gladly do that. Um, we did anticipate doing the community center at that next meeting, but if we can push that back as well so we focus on this item and try to keep that agenda a little bit lighter as this would be our first real effort on the discussion because I do believe this will kind of set the framework and the tone for this whole uh, conversation but I look for your direction and, and we're more than willing and ready to power through this thing but it's up to your your direction vice mayor Rhino well based on all the sticky notes I have on my binder I think it'll take more than an hour and a half so I would be okay if we continued it to the next meeting if we have a light agenda at that meeting and then we could get right into this as I recall, that we've got quite a few consent counter items, but on the new business and discussion items, off the top of my head, I was only remembering the community center, so that would be an easy one to move out one meeting and then try to focus on this issue. Councilmember Condit? Sure. Um, uh, to quote Vice Mayor Rhino from last meeting, I can go another three hours, but if my colleagues want to call it a night, I'm willing to call it a night as well. Councilmember Klein? Well, well, I was looking at these, and I just wonder if, how fast you can, you know, with limited discussion, I don't know what anybody else has, is if maybe we did Title I and Title II, and it, we at least get the thing started. I mean, it's general provisions and administration, ad, administration and personnel. Councilor Drossett. I don't feel good, so I say we table it. But if you guys want to stick around, I might just take off and go. I think I agree with uh, Vice Mayor Rhino. Um, I don't want you to get through the PowerPoint presentation and we get into one or two and then we break it up. I think it would be more cohesive if we kind of do it all at one time, at least all of these things. So if our next council meeting didn't have any of these on them. Correct. Yeah, if we can kind of clear that docket a little bit so that we can focus on these and maybe only a couple other items, um, that would probably be best. Yeah, th this wouldn't impact the schedule on the face of it. It just might be a little tighter going from the discussion item to the first public hearing. But uh, we, depending on the extent of the comments and the direction, we'll be able to give you an idea after that meeting whether it affects the schedule at all. In you know, a perfect world, it makes no change to the schedule. We're able to keep moving. Well, I've often found these things are so critical that we're dealing with that once you get past you know two or three hours in a meeting then people are just going to want to rush to get through it and i think we should take our time with it because i think it is very important and it will probably stay in effect for the next 20 years so it, it, i i agree with um uh, vice mayor rhino that we should table it to the next meeting are you okay with that mike that's fine you guys okay with that yeah okay so we'll go ahead and do that um so at this time we will move to council member referrals. Is there any, well, we'll, we will continue that item to the next meeting. Do we need a motion for that, Tom? No, okay. So council member referrals, is there anyone on the council that would like to have an item placed on a future agenda? Okay, hearing none uh, reports, um, I have nothing to report. Uh, council member Klein? I have nothing to report that, but I'm just glad to be around and you know, glad to be back, getting my energy level back, so, you know. Okay. Uh, Vice Mayor Rhino? There's been a lot of social media chatter about the water wasting the city has done at Smyrna. Do we have any kind of update on that, Mr. Wells? 
Yeah, Mr. Davis will provide an update. What would you like to know? Well, I'd like to know that according to the article in the Courier, it was the state who was holding us up on the permits that we needed? The state and our contractor. So what happens is, is when we loaded the, the media into those tanks, we put a water solution that went in with it, and we have to flush those tanks. The state couldn't give us a permit to operate. We were waiting on the contractor. I have a meeting with them tomorrow morning at 10 o'clock in their offices in Stockton, so hopefully when I leave there, I'll have a permit that we can run with. That's Thank my you. goal. And I know I've, I've talked to Mr. Wells about this before, but the tree wells on the north side of Fowler next to May Hensley, where all the trees have been taken out, and now there's grass and just dirt, can can we do something about that because now that school has started and as i've driven by there is such a um difference I, i'm just afraid of a trip hazard and everything i mean it's horrible and not only is it aesthetically ugly but it's really a it's a trip hazard so what is there what can we do about that? Can we fill it in or are we going to put trees and irrigation or Well the irrigation's there. The irrigation was cut off and put lower because the kids kept breaking it on us. Um, so we can go through and dig the dirt down a little bit and just put bark or something over the top of it. The problem is the kids come along and kick it all out. Right. You know, we can't put rocks in there because that's a bigger hazard. So um, is the issue would it would it make kind of more sense if we just filled that in? What, it, what was the point of having that? It was to, to make it look nicer with all the trees, but the trees have been gone for a number of years. And the ultimate goal is, is that once we get the tree program back up and, and revived to where it needs to be, is, is those trees get replaced. You know, we have hundreds of trees out in, the, in front of residential yards that need to be replaced as well. So in the meantime, we have to worry that kids are gonna be falling in there, and it's, it's ugly. I mean, it really, it's ugly. <laughs> I can go through there and concrete them back in. Well, I guess it would be up to the council if they wanted to do that, but have any of you driven by there and looked at how bad it looks? I mean, it, it's... It is a 10-foot sidewalk, so 10-foot sidewalk without any landscaping would be ugly looks or? ugly as well, um, or at least most people's perfect. We put those trees in for a reason. Um, I, would, I would argue that the tree choice was probably the wrong choice for that area. Um, we're going to replant them. We're going to do a different tree species there, but that's the better solution. Didn't didn't we authorize the tree planting program in this last budget? Uh, that's a tree trimming. That is okay. not tree planting. And we don't have money in the budget to not put for that trees? stretch. Not currently. How many trees would it take? Ten. Uh, I think it's more like twenty-ish. A good twenty. And then to revive the irrigation system, which just it's. It's time at that point, but probably 20 trees. So how much money would that cost to do the trees and the irrigation? A couple thousand dollars. Oh, so we could find that money in the budget for a couple thousand dollars. That's a council priority, of course. Would you like us to provide some information and we'll bring it back as an information item? I would, because to me, $2,000 would be worth it. I mean, it's a very visible section of series. That's all I have, thank you. Councilmember Droza? School begins my Wednesday with students, safe kids. Councilmember Condit? I've participated in a ride along with code enforcement recently. I wanna thank Chief Collins for scheduling it and Sergeant Coley for allowing me to ride along with him. Uh, my office hours will be canceled on Saturday, August 17th. I will reconvene office hours on August 24th. So, hope to see you there. Ms. Dean? Tom? Thank you, Mayor. Mr. Wells? Uh, thank you, Mayor. Just uh, two quick items. First one, Measure H Oversight Committee will be meeting on Wednesday, uh, the 14th, at 6 o'clock here in this uh, room. There'll be the, re the new first meeting for the three, uh, three newest appointments, sorry, that uh, were just put in, uh, appointed by this council. Um, <clears throat> and then also just wanted to highlight the SRWA project uh, milestone um, for those who were at the last board meeting, um, the selection of a preferred um, vendor the design build consultants and now into negotiations. Um, Jeremy and myself were in meetings all day today uh, negotiating that contract um, and that is moving forward at a, a very good pace. So we were 
pleased to see that uh, moving in the right direction. So more information will follow to the council here in the near future on the overall financial impacts of that project, which as of, as of today, the council had sent you information on the latest cost information. It's 25% lower than what was anticipated in our rates. Um, so once that contract is negotiated, we'll be able to relook at our rate structure um, and hopefully not have to do the rate increases in the future that we anticipated. Mr. Westbrook. Nothing, Mayor. Mr. Collins? Thank you. Mr. Wise? Uh, our new grass rig is done, completed, loaded with the equipment, and we're currently conducting the training. Um, it's going to be about two or three weeks when we're done with the training, and we'll get it in service. Also, last week, uh, Series Fire uh, Department hosted a countywide chief officer training. And with the help from the police department, uh, we actually scheduled this several months ago, but the topic was active shooter. Uh, Lieutenant Yandel put on the training for us, and it was uh, unfortunately very relevant to uh, what's been going on lately. But uh, we held that here at the community center, and it was very well received, and I think, I'd like to thank the police department for their assistance with that training. Thank you. Okay. Jeremy? Okay, at this time, we will adjourn to our next regularly scheduled meeting, which will be August 26th. Thank you.